Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'll be talking about my holiday costume for this year, which is based on Edwardian tea gowns. Tea gowns are pretty fascinating garments. They were worn while entertaining close friends for tea or for dinner in your own home. They weren't considered appropriate for wearing outside the house, but have a lot of features from elaborate ball gowns from the same era. These dresses were often worn without corsets and sometimes featured design elements inspired by medieval, Elizabethan, or even Georgian costume. I'll link a few posts that define them better in the description box, but these are basically really fancy robes. So pretty much my dream garment. I made mine from a green striped silk with several dozen yards of cotton lace for trim. It was worn without a corset and closes with a tie at the waistline. But before talking too much about making this, I need to warn you that this is one of the worst things I've made in a very long time, and is one of my worst attempts to document the making of something. I sort of knew going in that I didn't have time to construct this the way I wanted, and I didn't really know how to construct it, and I didn't really like how it looked until the very end. So I'm not proud of this, but I do think, especially with styles you're unfamiliar with, sometimes making something poorly is better than not making it at all. It takes a lot of the pressure off when you aren't trying to make it perfectly, and can give you confidence for similar future projects. That was my mindset on this one, and I think that shows in the quality of construction and how much I filmed, but hopefully it is enjoyable regardless. I draped the pattern on my dress form, as you can see here, and I actually didn't transfer any of these to paper. I used the pieces of muslin as a guide for cutting out the final garment. I think that shows how tight on time I was. <laughs> However, for the bodice, I did cut out the lining first, which is a lightweight cotton. Then I used the lining pieces as a guide for cutting out the silk layer. The bodice has six pieces in total, made from a three-piece pattern. The front pieces are shaped with gathers, and the back is cut almost like an 18th century gown, with the center back tapering to a point. The skirt is made from eight pieces and is broken into a top section and a bottom section, which are divided with a ruffle and lace inset work. This was a popular turn of the century style and was very necessary since my fabric isn't wide enough to cut the skirt pieces all as one. I draped the front and side skirt pieces separately initially, but decided to cut them as one with shaping in the form of a dart at the side. Then I pinned the bottom pieces together and sewed them with French seams. Very narrow French seams, since I added the wrong amount of seam allowance. Then I stitched a quarter inch away from the entire inner edge of the piece, and I planned on folding the edge inward at this point and using the stitching as a guideline, but I decided to sew on a lace ruffle instead. The lace starts where the piece begins to flare out, and I trimmed the top edge of the lace so it falls in line with the curve of the fabric. The lace was also gathered before sewing it on. Then with the right sides facing each other, I began sewing on a narrow band of lace, and this extends a full yard past the end of the fabric panels. Also, after sewing it on, it was ironed and steamed to match the curve of the fabric, and I top stitched the seam allowance so it was hidden under the fabric and ruffle layer. For lace inset to really be lace inset, there shouldn't be any fabric underneath the lace. Now the back upper portion of the skirt was gathered down to match the bottom edge of the center back bodice piece. They were pinned together, and I also pinned the dart in the front of the skirt piece, but I realized before sewing it that this step needs to be done after sewing the bodice portions on. I swear this project was like a giant puzzle. The order of assembly was super important. The back bodice and back skirt pieces were sewn together, and then I sewed the center back seam. I 
ironed the long edges of the panel inward by a quarter inch, then I top stitched it over the narrow lace. And I switched my sewing machine foot to a zipper foot so I could get right up against the edge. And I don't think I filmed any of the ironing, but all the lace portions were pressed after being sewn on to help form them to the curves. When I've done lace inset work in the past, I've always turned the edges inward twice before sewing them so they don't fray. And that is what I would recommend you do, but that is not what I did on this project. <laughs> Now the remaining bodice pieces are pinned and sewn to the skirt. I cut strips of silk and folded the edges inward and sewed this over top of the waist seam on the front most panels. This will serve as a drawstring and pull in the waistline. It also makes it look like the bodice and skirt were cut as one, as was common with tea gowns. But my fabric wasn't wide enough to actually do that because for some stupid reason, the stripes run up and down on the horizontal grain of the fabric instead of lengthwise. I pulled twine through the channels at the front, making sure to leave a long tail at both ends. Then I pinned the side seams of the bodice and the dart in the skirt. When sewing this, I made sure to backstitch over the twine so the end is secured into the seam and won't pull out when I tie the bodice closed. I really hope that makes sense and I'm really sorry that I don't have more visual references to share. I pretty much exclusively worked on this project after midnight. <laughs> then the long edge was turned inward and top stitched to the lace inset on the back panels. I also stitched a quarter inch away from the entire outer edge and this is a guideline for turning the edge inward and helps prevent fraying. And here we have one of the four photos that I took while constructing this. This is the upper portion and it is pretty much done, except for ironing. It really needed to be ironed. And I also had the lower portion, which looked like this. I pinned the folded edge of the upper panel over the lace on the lower portion, then I stitched across this edge by machine. And you might recall me mentioning a tail of lace on the lower panels, which extends past the fabric. That actually gets sewn around the neckline of the bodice and it meets at the center back. And at some point during this process, I also sewed the shoulder seams. And at this point, I thought it looked like a silk robe covered in toilet paper, and I did not want to finish it. I was so unhappy with it that I decided to work on the sleeves because I thought that would be the easiest part. And when the sleeves are the fun and easy and non-problematic part of a project, that is a really bad sign. <laughs> I did not film cutting out the sleeves because it was like one in the morning at this point and I forgot, but they are made from two pieces of silk with a lace ruffle across the hem. The lace was sewn on with a half inch allowance, then the seam allowance was stitched down to form a channel for ribbon. The top portion of this section was gathered down to 13 inches, then sewn on to the wider lace that I purchased for inset work. I gathered the lower edge of the top section as well and stitched it onto the other side of the lace. I saw a few references with tiered sleeves like this, and it reminded me a little bit of sleeves from the 1630s, which is my favorite period of fashion. And since tea gowns often had historical influences, I figured I could get away with it. Also, to help the sleeves hold their shape and force them to stay poofy, I sewed in bands of ribbon that were several inches shorter than the sleeves. These extend from the cuff all the way to the shoulder and make sure the length of the sleeve doesn't droop past my elbows. I gathered the bottom portions with ribbon that was pulled through the channels at the hem, and then I sewed the sides of each sleeve with a French seam. I'm not sure why I decided to get fancy with the seam finishing here because God knows I didn't do it anywhere else on this project, but I guess I wanted at least the sleeves to be nice. <laughs> the top edge was gathered down by hand to match the size of the arm side, which was 17 inches. Not that knowing that is especially helpful to you. <laughs> the sleeves were sewn on by machine. And let's just totally ignore the part of the interior of the bodice that you can see here because it's really embarrassing, okay? And then it was back to work on the dress. I sewed a band of wider lace around the entire gown and still hated it. So the obvious solution was more lace, which is why I'm sewing a giant ruffle around the entire thing. 
This goes from the neckline all the way around the hemline. And I actually sewed additional bands of lace around the neckline to make it more modest, only to realize I sewed them on with the wrong color of thread. And I didn't have time to unpick the stitches, so I just sewed more lace on top. Which actually worked surprisingly well. The collar has a ton of volume because of this, so not paying attention to my bobbin thread has ended happily for the first time ever. After fitting, the front was gaping open more than I wanted, so I decided to sew the ruffles on the front from the waist to around my knee together, forming a seam down the center front that keeps the dress closed. The waist is cinched in with a drawstring, and it holds itself together pretty well. However, it was impossible to get the skirt laid out nicely. So last minute, I cut huge lining panels out of polyester taffeta and bound all the edges with horsehair braid to give it some rigidity. This panel was sewn to the lining at the center back waist of the bodice, and the skirt was tacked around its hem. This added a lot of structure to the skirt, so it holds its shape when I walk and meant I could lay it out on my own for all of these images. Now for the 18th century inspired train. This was drafted as a single piece but cut into three sections to be suitable for the width of my fabric. Each section is joined with lace inset, so I ironed the edges inward by a quarter inch in preparation. Then the fabric was top stitched over the lace. It's divided with the wider lace at the bottom and the narrower lace at the top. And I'll link where I bought this lace from in the description box in case you're interested. I hemmed the long edges of this by machine, turning the edges inward twice and stitching them down. I pinned the train to the dress and absolutely hated it. It was too short and it was lacking the drama that I wanted. So I cut two strips of green silk that were slightly wider than the lace trim. Then I rounded the hem so it was slightly longer at the center point and sewed the pieces together. This was hemmed by machine, then I cut a piece of lace that was the same length and I trimmed at the top edge so it had the same curvature as the hem of the fabric. I gathered the top edge of the fabric and the lace down at the same time until the top edge was 40 inches long. Then I top stitched it to the bottom of the train. The train was pleated down to 10 inches at the top edge. There's a six inch wide box pleat in the center with a single one inch neck pleat on each side. Then the remaining material is turned under one inch away from the edge of the pleat, making it look like there are two neck pleats on either side. I tacked the portions folded inward down by hand with catch stitches, then hand stitched the top eight inches of the pleats down with running stitches. And that is all the footage that I have. The top edge of the train was eventually hemmed, then I sewed hooks onto both corners and bars onto the back of the dress bodice. These are hidden by the lace collar and allow the train to be taken on and off. I don't have any footage of this worn because I was terrified of it getting muddy, but it moves really well and is by far the comfiest historical costume I have ever made. And the lace ruffles look a lot less like toilet paper than I had originally thought they would. In fact, I really like how it looks, at least from the outside, which is all that matters in life anyway. I'm kidding, kind of. I'm really sorry that I didn't document this project better and that I'm not gonna be able to have a blog post about it since I took so few images of the process, but I hope you enjoyed the footage that I did have and that you liked the finished piece. I'd really love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below and I shall talk to all of you very soon.